All right, if you brought your Bibles, open up to James chapter 5. So we are in week 10 of James. Y'all ready to be done with James yet? Come on. A few people, few people said yes, people said come on. Like, y'all like getting beat up, huh? Come on, James has been bringing it, so it's good. If you missed any of those, go back to creekside.church. We've got all of them on our podcasts and YouTube and all the, the digital platforms. So make sure and go back and, and catch up. Um, we're going to read 13 through 20. I want to jump right into the scripture. I've got a lot to cover today. So I want to cro- close this out and just ask for uh, God's presence to be here as we open the word. So James chapter 5 verse 13 it says, if anyone among you is suffering, is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heavens gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So in seven verses here, the word prayer or pray is mentioned seven times. So what I want to talk about today is is really prayer. We're we're going to lean into this and unapologetically, we talk a lot about prayer. When we first launched our church, we said we were gonna be a house of prayer. It was a deep conviction of mine, and even as a pastor and teacher of the word, this is one of those spiritual disciplines that many times in my life I have failed to tap into. Like, and I mean like really pray. I'm not talking about just thank you for the grub, and then we go, or just night-night prayers with the kids. I'm talking about like, praying, you know? And and so I really believe that today God wants to to speak this into our church and we we, we do prayer and worship nights, we're gonna talk about those. We do prayer gatherings now, we're gonna talk uh, about those and I really believe that God just has convicted our team, starting with me all the way down hopefully to you of like, we need to be people of prayer. We need to really tap into this power source that God calls us to in praying. And I love the flow of this passage too because he starts with prayer and then he goes to praise and then he talks about healing and then it ends with salvation. And so you see the suffering. He says, if anyone among you, if you're suffering, what should you do? He says, pray. If anyone among you is cheerful, if things are good and God is blessing and God is moving, he says, then praise him, right? So you got prayer and worship right there. Just if things are tough, pray. If things are great and you're cheerful, then praise his name, be grateful. He says, if you're sick, go to the elders of the church, let them lay hands and anoint you with oil and pray and be healed. So, So praise comes from prayer. Suffering ends comes from prayer. Healing comes from prayer. And then he says, then confess your sins to one another that you might be healed so that we can then pray over one another that actually we can be healed even from the cause of our sin. And then ultimately we see that it leads to salvation. And I really believe that for us, this is what we gather for. Uh, I'll be honest with you and just like vulnerable for a minute, one of the most discouraging times of our service is when we open up our prayer team, when we call to communion or when we call for, for prayer because so often we're either terrified to pray or we don't know how to pray or maybe we're prideful and we don't want to like look like we've got issues. Cause let's just be honest. Can we just all raise our hand? We got issues, right? So look, look around. If you got issues, raise your hand, right? Like we all got issues, 
We all need prayer. We all need to confess things. Sometimes we just need to say, hey, let's praise God because things are good, but let's pray together. And so I really believe when Jesus said, my house is gonna be a house of prayer, I believe he meant it. He never said it's gonna be a house where just preaching is gonna be fire. He never said it's gonna be a house where worship is just gonna light up the room. He never said I'm gonna build a house for kids ministry, Nickelodeon for Jesus. He never said those things. Now they're good. And we, we, we love to praise and we love to teach God's word and we love to communicate and do all the things that we do and coffee and hosting and signage and, and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. And so we don't want prayer at Creekside to just be transition the communicator onto the, the stage. We don't want it to be just a transition from one moment to the next. We want it to be bathed in prayer. And so what we're gonna talk about today is prayer. And there's a tension here, I get this. Many of you are sitting in the room and you might even be thinking like, man, I don't really know how to pray. Anybody else terrified to just pray in front of other people? Like that's a common thing. One of the biggest fears of like humanity is to publicly speak in front of other people, right? Well, when you pray in front of other people, you gotta speak, right? And so that's part of the, the fear. And for some of us, maybe you just don't know how to pray. But I also think there's tension in this passage too because he says the prayer of the righteous is powerful, right? He says the prayer of the righteous is powerful. And I think many of you might be terrified to speak or terrified to pray, but I think we can also relate anybody else not feel righteous enough to pray sometimes. Because he says that the prayer of the righteous is what leads to healing. The prayer of the righteous is what leads to powerful praying, but see, this is where the good news comes in. This is where the gospel is good every single time. You see in Romans 3, verse 10, and then skip to 21, I'm not gonna put it on the screen, but in Romans, Paul's talking about that no one is righteous. Romans 3, read it, no one, not one single human being on this planet is righteous. So what is James talking about? That the prayers of the righteous, who are they? Paul says no one is righteous, not even one. They say, he says, nobody seeks for God, nobody falls, and then it gets real depressing and talks about just humanity and our depraved souls, how none of us worship, none of us do what's right, none of us on our own are ever going to pursue God. But then you see Paul again talking to the church in 2 Corinthians 15. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ though, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Listen to these adjectives, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, he says, we implore you, this is, this is Paul saying, I'm begging you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Put your faith in him, be saved, receive his grace. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him, listen, we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. And that when we become the righteousness of God, we become an ambassador. We become ministers of reconciliation. That now through our words, through our obedience, through our authority in Christ Jesus, through his righteousness, then we begin to see this. You see, the gospel gives us access to righteousness. And then righteousness gives us access to power. Write that down. The gospel is why you're righteous. Not because you're good. Not because you're lovely. Not because you serve. Not because your attendance is better than anyone else. Not because you pray more than anyone or read the Bible more than anyone or you don't sin more than your neighbor or you look better than the next person. Nothing you can ever do would satisfy the righteousness and the holiness of God but in Christ you're righteous every single person in the room, every single person that would just humble yourself to say, I'm not a lover of God, 
I'm like the Romans 3, that I'm far from God. Nothing in me pursues him, but yet I need Jesus. And so that's where the gospel comes in. And so we've always got to start there because we can talk about prayer all day long, but if it's not prayer of the righteous, if it's not rooted in Christ, then we're not moving any mountains. We're not going to see any power. We're not going to see God move in any kind of way. And so let's start with the gospel. Let's recognize that you need him. And if you're in the room and you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe your experience of church is is checking lists of what to do, what not to do. You've always struggled with guilt and shame. And maybe maybe the least amount of love you've ever received maybe was from the church. And on behalf of the big C church of the world, I'm sorry. That's not Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus came for you. Jesus died for you. And faith in him and his life and his death, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, it's this simple. This is, how, this is how you get righteousness. Believe in Jesus, that he lived, that he died, that he rose from the grave. Receive the free gift of salvation. He clothes you in righteousness. All of your sin, all of your shame, everything gets wiped clean. That's that new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now you're in Christ. And then James is saying, the prayers of those righteous people, there's power. There's power when we pray. The gospel gives us access to righteousness. Righteousness gives us access to power. And then I love the text. It goes on. James, now in here, he uses Elijah as an example, and I want to really just walk through this. And I love what he says. And, and, and do you guys know the prophet Elijah? If you don't, let me just tell you a little bit. So Elijah's the one that he referenced in James, the passage we just read. It says he prayed for famine, and there was famine. Then he prayed for rain, and there was rain. And you might hear that be like, oh, no, that's cool. But there was a scene in between that. It's one of my favorite scriptures um, in the Bible. It's where Elijah actually, the, the nation of Israel was, was totally just running from God like they always did. It was the same story over and over and over. If you're in a Bible reading plan, you're, you're in that Old Testament place where the, they just keep failing over and over and over again. And you read some of the prophets and it just wears you out because it's just judgment and fire and, and prophesying over like we're going to destroy you and your lands are going to be taken and kings are going to take over and they're going to take all your stuff. Like it's just, it, it's terrible. Well, that's where they were. Well, Elijah stood up and he says, no more. I'm a prophet of God. I'm going to speak for God. I'm going to call the nation of Israel back to him. And so he goes to the king. And the king was all about this pagan worship. They had all these false prophets and they had Baal worship. And you see all this stuff. Well, there was this epic, epic scene where Elijah literally says, hey, I'm one man, but I serve Yahweh, the God of Israel. You've got this Baals and gods and all these other little G gods. I serve the big G God, Yahweh. You got the little G gods. Why don't you call your boys together? You got like 450 prophets. Let's go to war. I'm one dude. You got 450. Meet me on the mountain and let's just see whose God is real. And you see this moment where he actually goes and he takes the altar and he rebuilds the altar, which I love that scene of rebuilding the altar because he was creating a, a space of worship. To me, that's like church planting. We're going to create a space. We're going to rebuild the altar. We're going to come together and we're going to build a house of prayer. And we're going to sacrifice all that we have. And we're going to worship God. He's, he's building this altar. And then he gets all the skeptics who are there. And I love what Elijah does. He doesn't. And so here, here's, the, here's the thing. Let's, let's, let's call on our gods. Let's put all this bull. They cut meat up, put it on. They want to have this barbecue. Like let's call on God and see who's going to bring fire. You call your gods. I'm going to call my God, the real true God. And we're going to see what happens. And I love Elijah, he's like, you go first. And so he's like, all right, so they do their thing and they're crying out, oh, Baal, oh, Baal. It's so funny, I love depending on what Bible you listen to, some of the times they do voices like, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, right? And they're calling on their gods all day long and Elijah's like, bro, is he coming? Where's your gods at, bro? Like, come on, I'm getting bored here. They just keep, I mean, they're they're cutting themselves. They're crying out. He's even kind of mocking them. Like, maybe he had to relieve himself. Maybe he's like sitting on the pot or whatever. Like, where's your gods at? I love Elijah. He's just that guy. Their gods never show up. And then Elijah begins to pray. And before he prays, he actually tells the skeptics in the crowd, hey, why don't you get some water? And now, now this is crazy. When you read scriptures like this and, and you think about the water, a lot of times when I've heard this passage taught, you think about the water being poured out over this altar was like a, almost just to up the ante a little, because it, it was. 
We're asking for fire. We're asking to burn up this, you know, cut up bull on the altar. Well, let me douse it with water. So it's almost like, hey, let me just show off a little bit. But that's not at all what was happening. Because they were actually in a famine. They were in a three-year famine. The land was literally without water. There had been no rain because Elijah had prayed that there would be no rain. That was the judgment of God. The land was literally being judged. It was drying up. Food supply was nowhere to be found. And so water in this moment, think about this. He's putting it on the altar. It was the most valuable commodity present. And he gets these jars and he gets the people who were there and they weren't even the worshipers of his God. He says, y'all get the water. Y'all pour it on the altar. Matter of fact, that's not enough. Do it again. Take four buckets three times. Douse this. And I mean, so think about this. He was bringing his best to the altar. He was saying, I'm going to sacrifice the most prized possession that we have in our presence. And so he was literally putting this on display. The significance of that water was he was going to bring his best. He was going to sacrifice the most because God was about to show up. God was about to provide. God always shows through. And by the way, it's really, really wet, but just wait because the fire's coming and it's about to lick it all up. I mean, literally, there was so much water. It says it poured over the, the altar and, and it filled the trenches around us. So this thing is just doused in what we would say like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of water is what it felt like in that moment. And he was getting everyone involved. I thought about this, and I love this. I actually heard a fantastic message from um, a guy named Tyler in Portland who preached this, and I was just writing notes, and I was, man, he, I learned so much. I just wanted to share some cliff notes, but he references even David here, and if you know the prayer of David, David one time said, I will not sacrifice anything to God that does not cost me anything. David said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring my leftovers to God. I'm gonna take the most valuable commodity we have and I'm gonna give it all because I believe that God is going to show up. Man, this is a man of faith. But James said he's a man just like you and me. He's a man of nature just like you and me. Elijah was not just some superstar. Elijah wasn't some super prophet. Elijah was a scrub like you and me that just believed that God is who he was, that God can do what he says that when God promises, he actually shows up. So he was simply a man of faith saying, I'm gonna bring my best to God and and I'm gonna put it out there. God, if you don't show up, this is gonna go really, really bad. If you don't show up, this, this, you're gonna make a fool of me. And it wasn't a fool of him, it was a fool of you because I'm putting you on display. That's what big faith, that's what big prayers do. And so I love this scene. So the first scene, there's kind of three scenes I wanna talk about and we'll just walk through this. The scene one was the fire fell from heaven. So God does, he prays, fire falls from heaven, licks up the altar, that's just an amazing scene. So here's 1 Kings 18, you can follow along, they'll be on the screens. There I'm gonna read 38 through 46. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trenches. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, that's capital L, Yahweh, he is God. The Lord, Yahweh, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Take all of the fakers. Take all of the phonies. Gather them together. Let, no one, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook. And he slaughtered them there. Come on. It's kind of an epic scene, but it's just like, let's go. God was showing up. God was showing out. God was, was, was saying, no, I am the Lord. When my people pray, when my people bring their best, when my people put me on display, I'm gonna get rid of all demonic forces, all evil, I'm gonna press back and I'm gonna show up and there will be judgment for evil. And I love this, then God shows up and then the people, what do they do? They immediately turn to worship, how could you not? If you're here today and you're a skeptic and the roof blows off and the fire from heaven falls and God reveals himself to you, which really is our prayer every week, that you would feel the presence of God, 
that in the songs that we sing and the word that we preach and the prayers that we pray that you would just sense that there is a loving God that is wooing your heart to him. That's our prayer, that you would turn to him and worship. And when God shows up, that's exactly what was happening and worship broke out. They were all saying, he is the Lord. I bet worship that day was just amazing. But here's what I want you to hear. Here's the tension again. God doesn't dream of the church being on fire. Think about that for a minute, and that might even sound a little weird because we talk about that sometimes. We talk about Lord Jesus just bring fire down and light, just ignite this passion, ignite revival in our church. Like let your spirit just break through the walls, let the roof be blown off and Holy Spirit fire just fall. We wanna see miracles, we wanna see supernatural things, we wanna see salvation and we're begging for this to happen but that's not what God is interested in. He's not just interested in bringing the fire. And so I'm gonna skip scene two and I wanna jump to scene three because I want you to see where this ends and then I'm gonna tie it all back together with this passage in James. So when you skip down, you see the end of the story, the scene three was you see the city saved and reborn because what happened was is the water actually came. It says in a little while the heavens grew black and the clouds and the winds and there was a great rain. So again, remember the story, Elijah prays judgment and famine, three and a half years later, there's this epic fire from heaven falls to show who Yahweh is. Then he goes and he prays and the wind comes and the rain comes. And when the rain actually falls, what that's resulting is the city actually being saved. You see, without water, they won't survive. This was a salvation moment for the city. This was God saying, I'm gonna pour from heaven the water that's gonna water the ground. And it's not just gonna be fire for the church and a worship experience, it's gonna be water for the land and healing for the city. You see, the fire is important because that's where it starts. When the church is lit on fire, it is this all-consuming fire. It is praise and worship erupting. It is the righteous being redeemed and starting to believe and pray and, and fire comes, miracles comes. You, you see the, the manifestation of the power of God on the church, but that's not the goal. See, the problem is in kind of Western thoughts and all this, like we want the worship, we want all of that, we want the fire, we want all the supernatural, but that's not the point, that's not the goal. This is the, that's for our experience, and yes, he's amazing, but it leads to something. It leads to the city being saved. It leads to us actually going now, doing something about this, doing something, stewarding the fire so that the rain can come, so that the rain can fall, so that the city might actually be saved. You see, God's hope in his heart is not just that we would be passionate lovers of him, but that all of creation would be reconciled to him. And so our fire has to go somewhere. It has to be intentional. And so scene two, let's get to scene two because we skipped this. This is what actually happens. So the fire falls, licks up the water. They begin to worship. Scene three was he prayed and the rain actually came. Well, what happened in between? First Kings 18, 41. And Elijah says to Ahab, this was the king, right after the fire scene. He says, go up and eat and drink for there's a sound of rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth and he put his face between his knees. I'm gonna come back to that. And he said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again. Seven times this happened. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariots and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black. Now we're at that verse that I just read. And a little while, the heavens grew black and the clouds and the winds. And there was this great rain. And Ahab rode, um, Ahab rode and went to Jezreel where he was headed. This wicked woman. We'll preach on that some other time. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garments and he ran before Ahab to enter into Jezreel or to, to the entrance of Jezreel where she was. 
And so I want to back up for a second, and I want to go back to this face between the knees. This is actually kind of an odd picture, and anytime you read things in Scripture that are odd, you should probably dig a little bit on it. So this posture is a very odd posture. Have you ever prayed with your head between your knees? Probably not. Uh, It's awkward, it's odd, but this is interesting. If you really dig into some of the original language here and you dig into some culture and, and some things that they were doing, some scholars have said that the posture that's being spoken of here is almost as if a woman was giving birth to a child. It was this posture of labor pains. Like he was, he was so fervent, was the word that James used. He was so fervent in prayer that he was in the posture of birthing a baby. He was literally on his face, head between his knees, begging God to move. This was what fervent prayer actually looks like. And I want you to hear this. There is a kind of prayer that leads to new life. There is a kind of prayer that leads to rain falling and cities being reborn. There is a type of faith that leads to the church on fire, prayer in this type of posture that leads to the city being reborn. That's the goal, that's what God is after, but here's where we're at in this, you can't skip scene two. You can't just pray for fire and God to show up and everything to happen and we're worshiping and everything's on fire. That was this display that leads to worship, that leads to faith, that leads to prayer, that then manifests in mission. Like Jesus said, go now into the world and preach the gospel. Pray bold prayers. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey. Follow me, trust me, continue, even through the suffering and the pain, and we covered all that through James, through all the trials. Trust me, I'm with you, I got you. But the goal is always salvation for the city. And I just think about kind of your story, and and man, if you know church history, and you know some of the fathers and mothers of the faith, and just the big, you know, faithful people, or, or maybe even like recently in your family, whose shoulders of prayers do you actually stand on? Think about that person. Think about just a couple generations down. Why are you even here in the room? I've got family in the room and I'm thinking about Grandma Bates. We're standing on their shoulders. They would put their face between their knees and they would cry out for their kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids' kids and here we are today worshiping Jesus. Whose shoulders are you standing on? Whose prayers are you standing on? And as you praise God for that, then start to think, who's gonna stand on your shoulders? What are your prayers? What does your fervent prayer look like? Have you ever been in a place where your face was literally between your knees and you were laboring in pain, like painfully laboring and working in this beautiful, powerful thing called prayer? And I will be honest with you, we need to do better. We need to pray more. I was sitting there thinking, and this is just a a confession, you know, I was just wondering, man, if I could just see the journals or see kind of the, the inventory of our church's prayers, if I could just look into like our prayer lives and say, how much do we actually labor in prayer? I was sitting there thinking, and this was just me judging, I'm confessing, it's probably not very much. But then right after I made this statement, I said to Corey, I said, you know what, bro? If you looked at mine, it wouldn't be much better. We don't labor in pain in prayer. We don't get on our face like we should, like Elijah, a man just like you and me. We don't actually labor in pain and do the work and ask for revival to come and ask for the rain to come and believe that we're gonna put ourselves on display and we're gonna bring our best and we're gonna trust that God is good and I'm gonna look like a fool if he doesn't show up because I've been praying so much that if God doesn't show up, then I just look like a fool. That's the type of fervent prayer that James was talking about and he used Elijah as this example. 
And what I love about this is the prayer in this moment in scene two, this was the slow prayer. He only prayed once for the fire and it came immediately. But he had to pray over and over and over again. Seven times he said, go look towards the sea and see if that rain's coming. Round one, nope, I don't see nothing. Did he quit? No, he said, do it again. Came back, man, I don't see anything. Do it again. I'm gonna keep praying. I'm gonna keep my head between my knees and I'm gonna labor in pain and I'm gonna keep praying until God moves. Comes back a fourth time, bro, I don't see anything. So he puts his face back in his knees and prays again. And he keeps praying and he keeps praying and he keeps praying and then finally, after seven trips, I see this tiny little hand, tiny little cloud starting to come in the sky. There it is, get ready, it's coming. There it is, get ready, it's coming. And then the clouds turn dark and the rain comes and the city is saved. He prayed once for fire, he had to pray seven times for rain, it's slow. It was in a private place. It was in a, in a, in a situation where he was all alone. It wasn't glamorous, it wasn't a big crowd. It was him in his secret place, head between his knees, laboring in pain, praying for this to happen. You see, we love the stuff that people can see. We love the worship when people can experience. We love the big crowds and we love all of the the showy stuff that we get to do. Well, that's not what he was about at all. He went to the mountaintop and he got in his prayer closet and he got on his face and he says, God, I'm gonna keep praying and I'm gonna keep laboring until you move because I know the fire wasn't the point. The rain is what we're asking for. The rain is what we're looking for. It's not just revival for your church on fire. It's rain for salvation for the city. And so let's be people of prayer. I love this idea of laboring. In John 16, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrows will turn into joy. He says, when a woman gives birth, he uses this analogy. She has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. What Jesus was saying is this laboring sucks. It's painful. It's anguish. Like, think about it. I've I, I, I never done it before. <laughs> but my wife has a couple times. Some of you in the room have, right? We, we as men act like we know what, what it's like, but we have no idea what it's like, right? But imagine that, and Jesus is saying, like, following me is like that. Fervent prayer is like that. In the moment, you want to kill everyone in sight. You're angry, you're hungry, you're swollen, you're hurting, like nothing's good. You're in the worst pain of your life, but the baby's coming. And when the baby comes, immediately it's so wonderful and so joyful that all of that anguish goes away. And Jesus is saying, if you're willing to labor in that pain, I promise you the reward is worth it. This is what our prayer life should look like and feel like. And I'm here again today to just confess with you, can we repent from our prayers and the way that we have labored in this? And if you're a prayer warrior in a room and you're saying, Pastor, I'm on it, praise God, keep it up, pray for me. Because I wanna be like you. I wanna be like Elijah. I wanna be like somebody who really believes and does the work. You see, because here's the thing, we're performance people. We need to like quantify everything we do. We need metrics and numbers and results and bigger crowds and more money and buildings and all these things to justify what we're doing, but that's not actually how this works. It's really us getting on our face and and praying and trusting and laboring that God is actually gonna move because it's really not about performance. It's about prayer. It's about praying. It's about praying and asking God to save the city, to bring the rain. It's not public, it's private. It's not a Sunday gathering, it's a prayer gathering. And we say this all the time. There's, I don't know where we read it, but it was like, you'll, you'll find out how popular your church is by Sunday gatherings. You'll find out how popular Jesus is by prayer gatherings. Are we willing to do the work? 
Are we willing to show up? Are we willing to actually get in our closets, face between our knees, and beg God to move so that the city can be saved? So again, the pattern here all throughout history, all revivals that you read about, the church catches fire, and it's followed by this increase of discipleship and prayer, and then it's followed by this outpouring of the spirit and power that leads to the entire city coming to know Jesus. But we can't skip the mountain. We can't go from the fire to the rain. We've got to labor on the mountain. We've got to labor in scene two so that we can ask God to move. Back to James, he says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It was the same flow here. Pray for healing if you're suffering. Pray, confess your sins, lay hands, like all of this. So again, it was this praise, it was this prayer, it was healing, but it always leads to salvation. It always leads to bringing those back. But here's the reality, we're never gonna labor again, like I said last week, if you don't believe God is good, if you don't believe God actually comes through, if you don't believe that he's actually gonna show up and do what he said, So that's number one, faith. How's your faith? Do you believe? Do you pray believing God is going to move? And then number two, your heart actually has to break for the lost. It can't be about fire here at Creekside. It has to be about rain in North Paulding, rain in Atlanta, rain in Georgia, rain in America, rain in this vision that we have to see a movement of God, like supernatural movement that results in planting, disciple-making churches all over the world. This is just the spark. All we are praying for is a spark right here, and that spark turns to flame so that we can pray for the rain so that many would be saved. But I would ask, do you believe God? How's your faith? But number two, do you mourn over the lost? Who needs to be sitting next to you? Who needs to be sitting at your dinner table? Who do you need to engage and have coffee and conversations? Who do you need to text this week and say, man, I would love to just love on you? Who are people in your life that don't know the hope and salvation of God? Who needs to be healed? Who needs to be, you know, praising? Who needs all of the promises of God? And does your heart actually break? You see, Elijah was weeping over the city. And he just came out of a revival, fire from heaven experience and worship, but he went directly to the mountain and was weeping, Lord, that's not the point, I need the rain. Bring the rain so that the whole city could be saved. And so are we willing to labor in praying for the lost? I wanna close with a story and then just give us some real practical next steps. You guys heard of uh, D.L. Moody? Look him up crazy story. We're reading a book on prayer um, by Pete Gregg, and uh, it's an amazing book. He shares this story, too, as one of just the testimonies of just praying and weeping and laboring over the lost. Moody actually had a list of 100 people that he was praying for salvation, and it says over his life, 96 of them came to know Jesus. 96 of a list of 100, he was in fervent prayer every single day, face between the knees, believing God for salvation for his lost friends. And then the story goes that at his funeral, the last four were there, and they accepted Christ after he was gone because of the testimony of his life and the power of his prayers that 100 people, 96 up until the day he died, and then the final four, God just saves him at his funeral. But he was laboring, an entire lifetime of laboring for his lost friends. Does your heart break for your friends like that? Does my heart break for our community like that? We need the fire, because that's a vessel, that's a a way that we're gonna carry the power of God but it's gotta be intentional and missional and it's gotta be us on our face, laboring on the mountain, praying for the lost and believing that salvation and the rain is gonna come. And so again, I'm gonna ask just for a couple things. Next week, we got our prayer and worship night. I'm asking you to be here. Once a quarter, we shut down Sunday morning, we come back. It's not just a free, hey, let's take off because we're tired. 
Yeah, mama and labor's tired too. Does she quit? She keeps pushing. So on those nights, I need you to be here. And it's not just to be prayed over, although we wanna serve you. Maybe you're not in need of prayer. We need you. We need you to pray for others. If you're in the room and you need healing, come ask for healing. If you need to confess your sins, come and ask for forgiveness. Like confess that there's healing in that. We have elders here that will lay hands and believe that, that healing will actually take place. And then we're gonna pray for one another. And we're gonna ask God to continue to stir this in us that we would go out and reach our lost friends and pray for our friends. If you're suffering, he said pray. If you're cheerful, we're gonna praise. If you're sick, let's lay hands and pray and then let's confess for healing. But I also wanna ask us, can we have a list? Maybe you don't know 100 lost people. Let's start with one. Let's start with one. Put someone on your heart, put someone on the list, and then labor every single day, begging God to move. It's not glamorous. No one's gonna praise you for that work. Nobody's probably even gonna see the work, but does your heart actually burn for that person that they might be saved? And so we've gotta pray for the lost. And it's not about duration, it's not about praying for five hours a day, it's about rhythms and consistency. It's just coming up and showing up every day. Start with a minute and see if a minute grows into five. Just faithfully every day start somewhere and see what God actually does. I wanna close with this and then I wanna pray. What stands between a church on fire and a downpour on a city being reborn as a mountain of prayer. Are you willing to go to the mountain? Are you willing to labor, do the work, the hard work of what it takes to actually see the city saved? Let's pray, Father, we love you. Jesus, thank you for your life, your death, your resurrection, your lordship that you're ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father right now. Lord, I ask if there's anyone in the room, I'm gonna go back to where we started. We've gotta start with the gospel. We're never gonna pray powerful prayers like James says if we're not a people who are righteous. And Lord, if we've been laboring, trying to become righteous because of our good deeds and good work, then we repent because there is no laboring that is gonna lead us to righteousness other than faith alone in Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. And so God, if anyone is in the room and they've never called upon your name, Holy Spirit, just work and move. Gift them faith right here and now. Draw them to yourself. Teach them what it means to call upon your name and to receive the grace of God. Give them boldness to come and ask for prayer as soon as we uh, dismiss here in a few minutes. God, if anyone is in the room that needs healing, give us boldness to come forward and ask for prayer. If anyone's in the room and they need to confess sin, give them boldness to come forward and let's wage war that we might be healed. God, if, you're, if, if we're here and things are good and we're cheerful, let us praise you with all that we have. Let us lift high our hands so that we can lift high the name of Jesus for the goodness that you bring in our life. God, whatever work needs to happen, Holy Spirit, we're gonna turn it over to you. We're gonna sing some songs and we're gonna bow our heads and we're gonna pray, but let this not just be another transition moment so that we can go to lunch. Let us actually sit in your presence. Gift us your righteousness that we might see the power of prayer, that we would see healing, that we would see revival, God, we are asking for the fire, but not as the the end, but just as the means to the rain. Give us the discipline. Give us the encouragement. Give us that boldness to go to the mountain, to get on our face, and to do the hard work of prayer. Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Jesus, we worship you. Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, be present in Jesus' name. Amen.